Good morning, or good afternoon, whenever it might be that you're are watching this video. And my prayer today as we open God's word together is that we would hear his voice, that we would know his blessing, and that we would experience his help. Well, do you know the great thing about the technology that we're using to do this today is that you can see me, but I can't see you. So if you sat at home on the sofa with a cup of tea and a piece of toast, don't worry. I can't see you. If I were to wave to you, you'd see me here in my office waving. But if you were to wave back, then I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be able to see you doing that. Well, today in Genesis chapter 16, we're going to meet the God who does see us wherever we are and whatever we're doing. And we're going to learn what a good thing it is to be seen by the God who sees us. So please do have your Bibles open at Genesis chapter 16. Today we're going to meet a hurting family. We're going to follow a fleeing woman and we're going to see a seeing God. Verses one to five, we get to meet this hurting family. And in verse one, we meet two women. These women are named, one is Sarah, one is Hagar. And we can see immediately the cause of Sarah's pain. She was an aging woman possibly in her mid-70s. She'd been promised a child, but as yet that child hadn't come. The clock had been ticking ever louder, but still no child. She felt the hurt of that. She felt the pain of not being able to conceive month by month, year by year. She was becoming a, a desperate woman. And here in verse 1, we, we meet a woman who was hurting to the point that she was ready to trust her own reason rather than to trust in God. So there's Sarah hurting in her childlessness. But we also meet another woman, that's Hagar, the Egyptian slave of Sarah. You cannot be a slave without suffering some kind of hurt. Here was a girl who had been brought from her homeland. Here was a girl who didn't enjoy the rights and the privileges of a free woman. So maybe she didn't know physical hurt that would be unlikely but I'm sure there was emotional and psychological hurt. So in verse 1, we meet two hurting women. But I want us to note, too, that though these two women had reasons to, to feel hurt, that actually both of these women were responsible for causing great hurt, too. Look at verse 2. Sarah said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So it was the acceptable custom of the time for a mistress to be able to give her maidservant, her slave, to her husband to conceive for her. Did you notice the wording? Did you notice the motive? Sarah was not interested in blessing Hagar, but only using Hagar. Hagar was owned. And the child that Hagar conceived and gave birth to could be claimed by Sarah. Maybe I can build a family through her. 
verse 3, we are introduced to Abraham's part in this story. Abraham agreed and he took Sarah's slave Hagar to be his wife. Abraham, without any faith, without any wisdom, without any counter argument, takes Hagar from Sarah to be his wife. He sleeps with her and she becomes pregnant. And then the story turns, the, the tables in the story turn. We now see Hagar assume a different position within the story, within the family. And now that she's the pregnant wife of Abraham, she begins to look at her mistress in a new way. She begins to despise Sarah. She's the one carrying the baby. She's the one in the maternity dress. She's the one with the bump. She openly despises her mistress. How hurtful that must have been for the childless Sarah to see those glances across the room. To know that she was not only childless but despised by her pregnant maidservant. Well, Abraham, again, feels something of the, the hurt himself. You cannot live in a family without hurt affecting other members of the family. And Abraham gets to feel the hurt too, as Sarah blames him for all of this. It was Sarah's idea. She gave Hagar to Abraham and now blames Abraham for what had happened. Sadly, we see Abraham missing the opportunity again to act wisely. And rather than acting wisely, he says to his wife, Sarah, do with Hagar as you please. And Sarah does just that. Hagar begins to feel the ill treatment of her mistress, Sarah. What a painful mess. What a painful mess. And all of this was seen by God. I wonder how you would describe your life. I wonder if there's anybody listening today who would be able to describe their life as a painful mess, a little like the mess that we've seen so far in the story of Genesis 16. Maybe you're ruining bad decisions. Maybe you're living with painful consequences. Maybe there's evidence of hurt done to you and hurt caused by you. Well, if that's so, I'm really glad that you're listening today. Here's what we're going to see as the story unfolds. No mess. Too messy for the God who sees. No hurt done to you. No hurt caused by you. Too painful. Too complex. Too difficult, too hopeless for the God who sees. The God we meet in the rest of the story is the God who cares. The God who comes close. And he's the God who can turn things round. A fleeing woman. Sarah begins with Abraham's permission to 
mistreat a, a pregnant slave, Hagar, this story is taking a, an ugly turn. Can you see what's happening here? A hurt person begins hurting another hurt person. Well, don't ever be tempted to do such a thing as the song goes. Everybody hurts. Don't ever be guilty of willfully adding to somebody else's hurt. You, you will hurt them. But you know you'll also end up hurting yourself. You will end up drinking the poison that you have prepared for someone else. Well, verse 6, the, the hurt must have escalated, whether it be uh, verbal, emotional or, or psychological. The hurt escalated to the point that the, the pregnant Hagar felt she had no other option other than to flee, to run, to make her escape. And she did that for, for relief. The intensity of her ill treatment meant that she, she needed to run. She needed to be elsewhere. She needed to escape. And we catch up with our runaway there in verse 7 on the road to Shur. But it wasn't how Hagar imagined. The relief she wanted, she did not find. For her, it was out of the frying pan and into the fire. As she found herself on the, the desert road. And there she was, in the heat of the day, without a protector, and without a provider, but it was there in her need that this runaway on the desert road was met. And she was met by the angel of the Lord. Angel literally means messenger. And we can see in verse 13, the reveal, the true identity of that messenger she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her you are the God who sees me she said the Lord himself was his own messenger here to Hagar and when the Lord spoke to her he, he asked her this question you'll see it there in verse 8 where have you come from and where are you going? What a great poignant question to ask a runaway. What a great poignant question to ask ourselves. Where have we come from and where are we going? If you have a look at her answer in verse 8, you'll see she did know where she came from. But she didn't know where she was going. How lost and alone she must have felt at the moment before the angel of the Lord met with her. Here's what she didn't realise. That every step that she had taken in running away from Sarah was a step seen by the Lord. Every tear that she cried was a tear seen by the Lord. She was lost and felt lost, but the Lord saw her in her lostness. And the Lord who sees knew where to find her. She was alone and felt alone, but the Lord who sees, saw her, and was able to draw near. Anyone listening in this morning who's been on the desert road this week? Any runaways listening in today? Wherever you run, however far, however fast, 
whatever road you're on right now, I want you to know that you cannot escape the gaze of the God who sees you. And that's a really good thing. It's a really good thing because he not only sees you, he is able to find you. He's the God who is able to come close. He is the God who is able to draw near. Listen to Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Thirdly, a seeing God. Chapter 16 really is a mess of Sarah, Abraham's and Hagar's making. But what we'll see next in the story is that God comes himself to meet Hagar in the middle of her mess. And he picks up the broken pieces of her life and he begins to put it back together again. Look at verse 9. I think we have something quite surprising there in verse 9. The angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. I think if we'd have met Hagar on that desert road, we would have said, keep running. Don't go back there. Sometimes... God asks us not to flee from hard things, but to turn and face up to them. And God, in his infinite wisdom here, was asking Hagar to do a hard thing, to go back to a difficult circumstance. But God, in his, his wisdom, knew that it was better, it was safer for Hagar to be in the tents of Abraham rather than on this desert road, which was dangerous, putting her life and the life of her child at risk. I want you to go home. I want you to turn around and go back. But I want you to notice that God doesn't send her back alone. Verses 11 and 12, God loads her up for the journey home with precious promises. Promises of his protection, promises of his provision, promises of his care, promises of future blessing for her and her son. God gives her everything she needs to turn around and head home. Well, she realises that this was no chance encounter. She'd just not met a random stranger here on the road. As she hears these words, as she meets this person, she realises that this was a divine appointment. This was God himself. 
And that meeting, that conversation led her to giving the person she met a name, a name that was reflective of his character, of his likeness, something that reflected her experience of, of this God to her. And you'll see that in verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lehe Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. The different versions of the Bible interpret this verse slightly differently. If you're using an ESV version, it talks of the Lord of seeing. If you're using the NIV, it says, you are the Lord who sees me. There's something more being expressed here than God's omnivision. God does have, have omnivision. He sees everything. He has that ability. But that's not just what's being expressed here. It's something more. Not just you are the God who sees. Nothing in all creation is hidden from his sight. But Hagar here is recognising that God has not only seen her, but in seeing her has had compassion on her. And that compassion has moved into to action. He has left heaven. He has come to earth. He's met her on this dangerous road. He's filled her with these precious promises. He's turned her around. He has her welfare and the welfare of her child at heart. You are not merely the God who sees. You are the God who sees me. This is really a synonym for you are the God who cares for me. Cares enough to have come and met me in the middle of my mess. Don't we have here a very familiar story? Uh, a story that shadows that greater salvation story. Uh, the time when the Son of Man would leave heaven for a little while and come to earth to seek and save that which was lost. That familiar story when God himself, through, through compassion, through care, through his love for, for lost sinners, came near, stepped into the middle of our mess, walked along a dangerous road with us, did all that was necessary to save us, to turn us around. Surely here we have a picture of the time when Jesus laid down his life as a wonderful demonstration of the God he is, the God who not only sees, but the God who cares. Did you notice how Hagar responded on hearing the words of God? How did she respond to her encounter? Well, she in fact responded with faith. What is faith? Faith is hearing the word of God and responding with action. She heard and she was, it led her to this moment of faith and it turned around and, uh, uh, and she headed back home. How do lost sinners head home? How do sinners become right with this loving, caring, compassionate God. Through faith, they hear the word of God. They respond with believing action. And they head home. Hagar, in that moment, gave, I'm sure gave Abraham and Sarah um, a helpful lesson in, 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 in what faith is, a reminder that they should have been living the, a life of faith, 
a life that hears the word of God and responds with believing action. And Hagar there gives us a lesson too of how we should respond to the God who sees us, the God who cares for us, the God who sent his son to save us. We too should respond with believing action. It's a familiar story. So let's make one final point of application. Maybe you're sat there thinking, well, Hagar could say that he's the God who cares for me. But how do you know he's the God who cares for you? Hagar could say it, but can you say it? How, how do you know that he does more than see you? How, how do you know that he cares for you in your messed up life? That he's seen you in all, in all of your struggles, the, the hurt done to you, the hurt caused by you, he's seen you and cared for you when you're feeling lost and alone, when you're on the desert road? How can you know? Well, can I assure you today that the God who sees you is the God who cares for you? And here's one way that you can know that. God has orchestrated all of the details of my life and your life so that together we're listening to his voice through Genesis 16. Through Hagar's story today, we're having a demonstration of God's care for you. There is something God wants you to hear, something God wants you to know. God this morning has come close to you, to encounter you where you are physically, where you are metaphorically. God has come with a message today of love and care and compassion. How will you respond to the God who sees you. Can I urge you to respond with faith, to, to hear his voice today and whatever he's been calling to you to do, would you respond with believing action? If it's to ask for his forgiveness, then, then would you do that? The forgiveness is possible through the cross, through the death of Jesus Christ. If he's calling you to face a, to a difficult situation, can I encourage you to do that? He, he will never leave you alone to do that. If he's calling you to do it, he will, he will give you all that you need to do that. If he's calling you back to live the life of faith, can I encourage you to take hold of all those precious promises that he's loaded us with in his word, to never leave us nor to forsake us. Would you take hold of some of those promises afresh and, and and face up to those difficult things. Today we've seen the God who sees us. And I pray that in doing so, we will not have only heard his voice, but we will have been empowered, strengthened and encouraged and enabled to do whatever God is calling us to do by faith. Amen.